Dostoevsky, writing in the 19th century, had one of his characters say, I feel like a person standing out in an open field with my skin stripped off of me, and the wind is blowing sand into my muscles. It's supposed to be a very deep statement of existential angst. Fast forward to 1950s. Carson McCullers in The Member of the Wedding has a young girl who's going through an awkward period in life, saying at one point in the novel, I feel like I'm standing in an open field with my skin stripped off me, and the wind is blowing sand onto me. What I need is a good ice cream cone. This relates to the fact that we come to life with hunger, and we identify the hunger, and we identify what's going to satisfy the hunger, and that's what drives our lives. But if our perception is off, we're not going to be satisfied. In fact, that's been our experience. We hunger for, for food, we hunger for relationships, we hunger for wealth. We can try all kinds of things to satisfy our hunger. What the Buddha is offering is a way to give genuine satisfaction. Yes, it is possible to find a dimension in the mind that doesn't need to feed, not because it's stone cold and insensitive, but it's found a happiness that is totally satisfying. But this means we have to look at the way we identify our hungers and try to satisfy them so we can train them in the right direction. One, you have to see that this sort of happiness is possible. And for this much, we go on faith when we start out, because we have no idea, we haven't seen it. We just have the sense that the ways we've been trying to satisfy our hungers in the past haven't really brought satisfaction. So maybe this is a possibility. We look at the people who teach this, they seem to be reliable, and they tell us that it's simply a matter of developing qualities that we already have. It doesn't require anything superhuman. It doesn't require any cosmic being coming in from outside to do this for us. We've got the potentials within ourselves. We've got the potential for ardency. We've got the potential for resolution, you know, sticking with something. And we've got the potential for heedfulness, realizing the importance of our actions, and that it really does make a difference how we act. Those are the qualities that the Buddha said led to his awakening. Those are the qualities that we all have in a potential form. So these are the ones we want to bring to the practice. And the Buddha has us feed ourselves with good things in the practice. We're fed with generosity. In the beginning it seems counterintuitive. You give something away, but you get fed. On the immediate level, there's a sense of well-being that comes when you know that you have more than you need and you have enough to share. And it feels good to share. And you learn to relish that feeling. And it teaches you a good lesson that many of the things that you're holding on to would give you a lot more happiness if you let them go. The same with the precepts, certain activities that we engage in we don't feel quite right about. Killing, stealing, illicit sex. But part of the mind says, I don't know how to survive without them, because they do satisfy a kind of hunger. But you have to realize you have a, a deeper hunger and a hunger that can be satisfied in better ways. And then there's the, the pleasure that comes from concentration. And again, in the beginning, it may not seem all that pleasurable. The mind is doing things that it's never done before. It feels like it's being penned in. You have to stay with the breath. You can't go anywhere else. The Buddha compares this to being a wild elephant brought in to be tamed. The elephant gets chained to a post, and everything it's trying to do is get away from that post. But in the meantime, they bring it good food. In fact, in the old days, they actually played musical instruments for the elephants to calm them down. 
And finally, they get used to being with human beings. And a lot of their wild and forest ways get tamed. It's the same with the mind. You give it some pleasure in the way you breathe. Notice the in-breath, notice the out-breath. Notice the way you breathe out. And John Lee talks about getting all the, the bad air in your lungs out each time you breathe out. So breathe in a way that allows all the, the bad air to get out and see what happens as you breathe back in. Learn how to breathe in a way that feels good. It feels good all over. Try to be aware of the whole body and think of the breath as a process that's affecting the whole body and how we're going to breathe in a way that feels good for the whole body. If you make your point of attention too narrow, you may be able to get that point comfortable, but other parts of the body will be starved. So you've got to think of the whole body breathing in. And John Lee talks about getting the breath in one spot comfortable first and then spreading it around. In my own practice, I found it works best to be aware of the whole body and find a spot that's comfortable and maintain that sense of comfort within the context of the whole body and then let it spread. So different people will find that the steps go in different orders, but the important thing is to have a sense of well-being and then allow it to slosh around the whole body, connect up with whatever good sensations are already there, and let them crowd out the uncomfortable sensations or dissolve them away. And you're feeding yourself with good food right here. When the mind is well fed like this, its hunger for a lot of unskillful things is going to go away. There's an interesting passage where the, the Buddha is talking about how the Jains, who are really into self-torture, like to accuse the Buddhists of being devoted to pleasure. And the Buddha said there are some ways in which that's right and other ways in which it's wrong. If you're talking about being devoted to the pleasure of killing, stealing, illicit sex, devoted to the pleasure of indulging yourself in sensual pleasures, indulging yourself in sensual plans. He said, though those not, aren't the pleasures that we're devoted to. We're devoted to the pleasures of the four, the four jhanas, the four stages of right concentration, because those pleasures actually lead toward awakening, because they teach you how to feed yourself in a new way, in a way that's less harmful for the world around you, that's less harmful in yourself. The, the mind feels well fed inside. It's going to see things in a different way. When they've mapped the brain, they found that there's one part of the brain that gives you your basic map of reality, how you see things. And some of the nerves that go directly to that part of the brain come from your gut. In other words, your picture of reality is going to be influenced by what's going on inside the body inside your digestive system, inside your mu muscle memory or muscle awareness. All these things feed into the mind, feed into the brain first, and then they feed into the mind, and they shape the mind. As the Buddha said, feeling and perceptions are the things that shape our mind. And so when you're operating with a feeling of hunger, that's going to determine what you see and how you identify the hunger and how you label the hunger and then how you label things outside. All of this shapes the way you're going to approach reality, and all of this tends to happen before we even hit sensory contact. And it's because of these things that happen before we hit the senses. If they're done in ignorance, we're going to suffer. What we're trying to do here is bring some awareness to the process. It's one of the reasons why right view is the first factor of the path, because right view is what counteracts the ignorance that we bring to these processes. You tend to see simply how the way you breathe, how the way you perceive things shapes everything else. You, we can do that in a way that causes less suffering. Then in doing the shaping, 
with awareness and it all becomes a path. Right view is what makes the difference between what you're doing being a wrong path and a right path for the end of suffering. To try to get in touch with your hungers. I mean, it was hunger that drove you to be born here in the first place. You couldn't stay where you were before, and so we'd set out looking for another place, another identity to take on, so you could continue going with your cravings and your clingings. That's how you got here. And this is considered one of the relatively good levels of being. And we look around the world right now and things look pretty miserable. But at least we have the opportunity to practice now. We have the opportunity to look at our hungers and learn how to step back from them, because we've got a different kind of food here, the food that comes from getting the mind to settle in. Then we can look at the hungers that normally drive us and realize that we don't have to follow them. There's better food. It's like realizing that there's some sorts of food that taste good but are going to eat, corrode your insides. And having the good sense not to eat that kind of food anymore. That doesn't mean you have to starve, because the Buddha does provide you with this alternative food. So take strength from this food. Because this is what allows you to follow the path that reaches that point. As I said, what the Buddha said, there's genuine satisfaction. Even more satisfying than the satisfaction that comes when the mind settles in and feels at home here in the present moment. That's just a step in the right direction. But it is the right direction. As I said, until you've found that dimension that the Buddha is talking about, where there is genuine satisfaction, it's always going to be something you take on faith. But that faith will enable you to make some sacrifices that you wouldn't have been able to make otherwise. Again, think about that act of giving. In the beginning you may think, oh, if I give things up, I'm going to be poorer. But then when you actually give them up, you find that you're richer. It's a different kind of wealth, a different kind of food for the mind. And so what you find as you go along the path, there are a lot of things that you've been holding on to that you really, really treasure. But then you begin to realize you'd be better off without them. And our conviction, there have been people who followed this way before us, and they've come back saying, yeah, that genuine satisfaction comes from learning how to let go. So let that article of faith or that article of conviction be one of the perceptions that shapes your view of what's going on. Because it will lead you on. To the point where he said, you find something that satisfies hungers you didn't even realize you had, and it reaches a level of satisfaction you never believed possible. <laughs>